Welcome to Simper Sometimes with Benny. So, um, I have Gunnery Sergeant Easterly with us, um, the writer of Born in a Bar. Um, I'm just excited to have him here because we've been talking for a couple of months about, you know, getting you out here, getting you to the house, um, or the garage, we should say. Um, and it's a phenomenal time because we were brought together by friends that we didn't even know we had that were mutual. Um, you know, this guy that just started following me on Instagram, who's an artist, um, Captain Mike, I don't know his last name, I feel horrible right now, um, but he's on his Instagram, it's 40 Mike Mike, um, and he drew a picture of a friend of mine that had passed away, I shared his picture, and then my next feed was me sharing your book, and he was like, shit, I know Gunny Easterly, um, and then James Adams recommended you as a, you know, a good friend and someone to talk to and have on the show. So thank you to you guys for recommending me having him on the show. Thank you for writing your book. Um, and let's let's go. So who is Gunny Easterly? That's the, the question I got. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in, in Marine terms, I'm a nobody. You okay. know, like I, I don't really feel like I did anything special. Um, I think I, you know, most people like our age, my age, we joined the military because we felt like we needed to serve. Um, so I, I joined in... Um, 92, um, the depth anyway, I depthed in 92, junior in high school. Um, I knew for a long time that I wanted to be in the military. I said my uncle was 82nd Airborne. Um, he always used to talk shit that they were the best of the best, you know, and how am I going to do better than him? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a bunch of movies that are out, like Heartbreak Ridge, Full Metal Jacket, and I saw this as this is the shit. This is better. This is my one up, my uncle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so during that time, the Gulf War was going on. Went to a bunch of different uh, war, um, uh, uh, just you know, parties mm -hmm. you would call them. Um, and uh, I, I made up my mind, this is what I'm doing. My dad was the only one that really knew what I was doing. Didn't tell my mom until way after I called the recruiter. Um, small town, we had more more cows than people. Oh, wow. Couldn't wow! I couldn't wait to get out of there. Just mm -hmm. you know, I knew what I was doing. Had my whole plan. You know, like I, I want to join the Marines. I want to. I want to get out after four years, go to college, come back in as a Marine Corps officer, and then FBI, CIA, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So picked up the phone at that time, called the the local recruiter, and uh, Sergeant Land, and I was like, "Listen, here's my plan. This is what I want to do. I want to be infantry. I want to do this. I want to do this." And and you know, he kind of laughed. He was like, "Hey, pump the brakes a little bit. Let let's talk." All right, and uh, you know, told him you know what I was interested in. Would I want to do infantry or be an MP? Uh, because I think that would help me progress to where I want to get into the FBI. And uh, he, you know, said, "Look, MPs, you know, what do the MPs do all day long? They stand at the gate and they do this." Yeah. So is that really what you want? I said, "No, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound you know fun at all." So he told me about security forces. It's like, look, you know, it's it, it's not like a high-profile job, but it'll get you a PRP billet. It'll help you progress into what you want to do. Plus, after two years, then you're infantry. Sweet. All right, this, this is perfect. All right, well, we're going to come out. We'll come out to your house. Um, they brought the little chip cards. You know, hey, pick out yeah, what, yeah. You know, what's important to you. They showed up to my house. and At this point, I still had not told my mom, right? Still had no idea. Uh, so they show up. Uh, so he was a sergeant. He brought out the staff NCO, came with me. I don't remember his name, but they showed up in full uh, blues. Yeah. You know, and when they got out of their car, the GOV, and was walking out to my house, I was just like, fuck yeah, this is absolutely what I want to do. Yeah. And uh, so they came in, sat down at the kitchen table, talked a little bit, talked to my mom, and my mom is just. So what was your mom's thought? As was, so she, I mean, her. like so she, she didn't even know like, didn't as know. they were getting out of the car, yeah, that's they, when she finds this out? She finds out as they're walking into the house. And how does, what's going through her mind? Like, uh, have you had so she, you could tell since? like she, she was <laughs> like, almost bounded. like she wanted to cry. She didn't know what to say because she, you know, this is, holy, holy crap, wait a yeah. minute. And uh, you said that you've never spoken about it. No, so never. I never thought an idea. Nope. Like your dad knew, but she. Yep. Now was she pissed that your dad? Did she ever find out your dad knew and she didn't know? Um, yeah, I think yeah, we probably had this conversation because <laughs> my mom and my dad were divorced. At, oh, you know, okay, okay. While I was, I think I was like five, but um, you know, I had talked to my dad about mm -hmm. it, um, and I know, you know, he probably said, "Hey, you need to talk to your mom." 
Yeah. And I knew like this, my mom is not gonna like this. I, yeah, I can't. Yeah. I, I'll 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 talk to her eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they they came in and and uh, you know she afterwards she was just like really upset. Like you know like are you are you sure? Are you real? Like this is, mom. This is what I want to do. This mm-hmm. is this is where I I see myself doing. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I already had my plan. I knew what I was going to do for a career, and this was part of the steps to get there. And, uh, you know, being a recruiter, how often have you heard about recruiters lying, you know, to... Right. Bro, too much, man. Yeah. And I can only imagine, like, I can only imagine that time, like in 1992, 93, yeah. like I was three years old, but I can only imagine how different it was. Right. Because back then, you didn't have Google. You didn't have... Yeah you know, Yelp, you didn't have the ability to go up and see or go on Facebook to recruiterslied2me.com. Yeah, exactly. You know, you didn't know. So anything you were going off of was literally what the recruiter said. Right. Yep. You know, and I think that's why that stigma is still there from people. Because even people now, like I just got off being a recruiter in March, but like when I was on recruiting, all I ever heard from the Marine Corps, like friends of mine, bro, recruiters are liars. And then all I ever heard from the local populace was, recruiters are liars. So the first thing I had to do as a recruiter was show people that, bro, I'm not a liar. Right, the stigma. Like, yeah. listen, like, I'm not, because at, at this point, it's, you realize that, bro, there's so much, you're, and especially in today's world, if you make one little slip up, someone's going to find out. Absolutely. And especially in a small town like Middletown, New Jersey, you know, you have one person hear something negative about you. That one mom is going to go tell other moms, like, no, don't go near Bennett. Absolutely. Go to this other branch. Don't go near the Marine Corps. And I was, it ended up flipping it. You know, I was able to have people literally tell, like, I had a vice principal who literally would tell every parent in the school when they were like, oh, you, they would like, when parents would come to him and ask him, like, about the military, the first thing he would say was, have you spoken to Staff Sergeant Bennett? He's a alumni of Middletown North. Have you talked to him? Oh, no, my kid's not joining the Marine Corps. That was immediately the thought process. Yeah. But he would just sit there and be like, listen, go talk to Staff Sergeant Bennett. And it was because I built a relationship with him. It's because I never lied to him. And he knew me for years on end. And I was able to just show people that, like, no, recruiters aren't liars. Right. And that's why, like, when I was up, when I was a recruiter, I would tell people everything point blank because my number one pet peeve is when I see people on Facebook saying, my recruiter this, my recruiter that. It's like, bitch, no, you made a mistake. You didn't a- end up with your part. Your recruiter didn't lie to you. Now, maybe he did, but that's why I always made sure I didn't lie to nobody because I would literally point you out and be like, bitch, what did I say to you? So, like, yep. you know, really random real quick, but that just happened. Last month, I'm at drill, and I end up, I put a, a Marine in the in the Marine Corps, He's joined at like 27, 28 years old. Um, he is a cousin of one of the Marines that I know. And that just came up in conversation. Like it wasn't even a known thing until we were doing the interview. And he asked me, like he was like all about the reserve program. And I just told him, I was like, listen, Barton. It, and this is what I told everybody. I will only recommend the reserves to you if you decide that you have a plan to come home to. If you already have a career, if you already have things going on and you just want to supplement some time and you just, excuse me, and you just want to add something to your, you know, your resume, you have this pride, but you, you know, you, you can't facilitate going active duty and leaving home, but you still want to do it, go reserves. But if you join the reserve program to come back to what you left with no yeah. money, with no nothing, then why are you joining? Right. Because you're going to complain and bitch about how the Marine Corps didn't help me. So I was like, so, do you have a plan? Is there a reason why you're going reserves? He was like, yeah, I already have a career. I want to do this. I want to do that. But it's my time to serve. I wanted to serve at a young age. My parents said no, but here I am now. Right. So I was like, okay. And I was like, so what am I telling you? He said, you're telling me to make a decision based off of my own my own situation. I said, okay. So I'm not telling you to go reserves. He goes, you're not telling me to go reserves. I said, okay. So literally, two years later, I show up to this new unit. He's standing down the hall. And I see him. And this, this dude that I just met, Staff Sergeant Castillo, is like, yo, you were probably a fucking liar. All recruiters are liars. And I was like, bro, I don't lie. Like, I just yeah. not. He was like, that's what a recruiter would say. I was like, watch this. And I see Barton. I'm like, yo, Barton, come here. He goes, yes, Staff Sergeant? He comes walking up. I'm like, what's going on, man? He's like, nothing much, Staff Sergeant. How are you? I, and all I said to him was, did I lie to you? He goes, fuck no. You told me not to go reserves. <laughs> yep. And yep. I was just like, and Castillo was like, 
oh, okay, well, maybe you're different. Yeah. But that was just the reason. You know, I want people to make their own decisions and not blame it on somebody else. Right. I don't want to, you know, and, and that's what happens a lot of times is that it's not that you're lying. It's that active duty Marines don't know anything about the reserve program. Right. So they say what they think, but they don't know. Yeah. And then it's a lie because, well, I was misinformed. But back to what you were talking about. So <laughs> boot camp. Yeah. I'm in boot camp. And uh, we got to the point, I th- you know, it's probably sometime in third phase when they're you know, talking about MOSs and what your job is. And, uh, you know, they went through and they were telling everybody who's infantry, you know, whatever. And they came up to one of the kids in my platoon and he was like, no, I'm security forces. And the drill instructor started laughing. And he was like, all right, who all here is security forces? You know, like five or six of us raised our hand. We actually had a bunch in my, my platoon. And uh, he said, okay, for you guys... Who here is infantry? So me and I came in on a buddy program. We both knew, you know, because our our our, uh, our recruiter was straight with us. Yeah. So we both raised our hand, and the other three guys were like, "Like, what do you know? I'm security forces." And they were like, "Look, you're going to security forces, and then guess what? You're going infantry." Yeah. You know, so they were completely clueless. Yeah. Um, but our my you know my recruiter was I mean he was straight. Yeah. And you know I'm thankful. Well, and that's the thing that shows you right now is that you still know his name and Absolutely, he's still yeah. somebody you talk about. You even yeah. mentioned him in the beginning of the book yep. because like, that's the thing is there's so many people. And I said this one time and I actually really gotten, I got into a heated argument. I got chewed out by my best friend. Well, he's now my, one of my best friends. And this was like our first altercation. Like this is how we hated each other. So I'm in the mall and this kid comes walking up. And I start trying to recruit him. And he's like, nah, man, I'm not joining the Marine Corps. Da, da, da. I start saying some stupid shit. But then he's like, oh, I'm already talking to a recruiter. I was just like, but I think he's bullshitting. Yeah. So I was like, oh, who? Who are you talking to? He's like, oh, Sergeant. And he doesn't know a name. I'm like, bitch, so you're not talking to nobody. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm like, well, you don't have his number saved in your phone? He's like, no, buddy, it's right here. I was just texting him. So I was like, call him. So he calls the dude. I take the phone from him. This is some random dude I've never met in my life. I take the phone from him. I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? I was like, who is this? He goes, excuse me? He goes, why the hell are you calling my phone asking me who the fuck this is? I was like, well, hey, man, this is Sergeant Bennett, and I'm just trying to find out why this kid's saying he's talking to a recruiter, and he don't even know his fucking name. I was like, I guess you're not fucking impactful. You probably fucking suck. And he's like, what? He's like, yo, get the blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, I just hear his gunny take the phone and he's like who the hell is this and why are you on the phone with my recruiter messing with his kid and i was like oh shit so i just hung up i think i just hung up or some shit so i'm like fuck and i had heard about this gunny i had heard about him i didn't i'd never yeah. really met him i met him like one or two times we had never actually like he was the meps he was he had just become the boss of the office and me and him had never really like spoken too much <laughs> And, um, like, I had met him a lot of times at MEPS, but we never had, a, like, a full-on conversation at this point. And this dude, Ra- this dude, now I know him as Ramos, this dude was a brand-new recruiter, like, two, three months into the street. So, and and I didn't get to explain what my purpose was, like, behind it. Like, I thought what I was doing was was the right thing to do, you right. know what I mean? And, I, and finally, later on, I got to explain that to them. But I get back to the office, and my gunny, gunny Rama, I walk in the office, he goes... Bennett! I was like, fuck, oh, fuck, I'm fucked. I was like, yes, Gunny. He slams the door. What the fuck are you doing? Who the fuck do you think you are? He goes, you think you're some fucking god amongst men because you're a fucking decent recruiter? He's like, nobody fucking cares about how good you are. He's like, you don't answer the phone like that. You don't do what you did. And I was like, I was like, Gunny, can I speak? He goes, no, you can't fucking speak. I was like, Gunny, can I explain? He's like, what, what, what? I was like, Gunny. I asked the kid who his recruiter was. I thought he was fucking bullshit and making yeah. up some bullshit. I was trying to call him on the spot, and then he put the recruiter on the phone. I was like, Gunny, what type of ex- what what type of experience have you given this kid if he doesn't even know the recruiter? Right, name? absolutely. Like, I'm not being an asshole. I'm just being honest. Like, and if he's a brand new recruiter, like, that's all I was trying to point out. Like, I right. wasn't trying to be rude or malicious or anything like that. And um. So the gun, the other gun, he calls me and he starts blasting me too. He's like, I don't give a damn. I don't want to hear your explanation. Just don't do that shit again. I don't give a fuck how good you are, Bennett. He's like, I don't give a fuck that you wrote before this month. He goes, you don't fucking treat somebody like that. You don't talk down to somebody like that. 
And I was like, that's not what, I was like, good to go, Vinny. So I hang up the phone. So this beak, this grew into this huge, like, animosity. And I didn't know this. I didn't know this. But this recruiter hated me now. He yeah, had this absolutely. vision of me oh, yeah. that I was this piece of shit, that I was a scumbag. So I ended up, go, like, about six months later, I ended up going to that office and working with him. And he would look at me and we would like every day he'd be like a I'd be like so one day I was like bro what is what's the problem bro he's like you know who I am right I was like no he's like I'm the motherfucker that you called I was like oh shit that's you I was like bro my bad I was like listen and I ended up telling him what I was trying he's like no I get that now but he was like the way that you yeah. went about it wasn't right da 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 and now me and him are freaking boys uh, me and the gunny you know me Ramos um he's still on um, recruiting duty right now. And then Gunnery Sergeant Odenbrecht, he's still out there on recruiting duty. But that's how, like, it was just so funny because, like, that's my thing. Yeah. Is that if you don't leave an impactful impression and then years later someone's like, hey, man, who was your recruiter? And they don't know, then that means that, like, you weren't that great of a recruiter. Right. Like, if you don't remember the person that you literally, like, you probably remember your first ever girlfriend. Yeah. You probably remember, you know, pinnacle people in your life. And your recruiter should be a freaking very pivotal absolutely. part of yeah, your absolutely. life. So if you don't know his name, it's like, well, how really impactful was that dude? Right. You know, did he, what he said to you, did it matter? Did it fester? Did it, you know, get inside of your head, your mind, your soul? Like, or was he just some dude that, you know, said, hey, man, sign right here and, you know, have a good day? Yeah. You know, because I still remember my recruiter, you know, as Staff Sergeant Tice, now me, I think Gunny, I'm not sure. But, yeah, man, so... How was so? How was your experience in those earlier years of like being in the Marine Corps? That such like because it's so different, you know. I'm it's 2021, and you know, and you got out at 17 years. So what was it like being in the Marine Corps at such a different time as opposed to now? So, I mean, I so I've been out for uh, 11 years now. Okay. But you see, the in, in 93, you didn't have social media. Yeah. I mean, you didn't even have phones. Yeah. You know, we did, but they were those bag, you know, the bag phones. That, um, but I remember getting to my first duty station. So I went to Kings Bay, Georgia, the Security Forces. Um, and I remember, you know, you, you meet a staff sergeant, and you'll read these once you go through. But, um, and we had this term called dropping a dime. Right? So we get there, and he's taking us, talking us, taking us around, showing us everything. And he has this, look, if, if you see something wrong, you need to tell me so I can take care of it. And he was really talking about, like, getting people busted. And we find out while we were at security forces that that was like a big thing. Like they were trying to find, you know, people to kick out. Um, and I thought this was funny, you know, so we had our badges and I put a dime in my badge just as a, you know, as a joke. Um, there was a gunny who was on um, like restriction uh, because he had his like first or second D DUI. In 93, you know, a lot of this stuff that, you know, I, I always tell people at security forces while we were there, I don't know how I left there without an NJP killing somebody or killing myself mm. uh, because we did a lot of stupid shit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had these uh, four-wheel, um, kind of like an LAV, they were called the Dragoon, and we used to jump them over this bridge. Uh, and then you'd have to power it down real quick because there was a, a cinder block wall that you'd have to make a left-hand turn. And we thought this was funny. And, and at 19, you're invincible, right? Mm -hmm. You're never going to get, you're never going to die. You're no, nothing's ever going to happen to you bad. And luckily, nothing ever did. Um but, you know, then, such a different time. You know, you could get in trouble, and your NCOs, your staff NCOs, they had already lived through that. Like, look, we did stupid shit, too. Um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to talk to you, and I have counseling, but I'm not going to write you up. I'm yeah. not going to, you're not going to send me to see the man. Um, and that, that really made an impression on my life. Yeah. Um, it, I talk, you know, you talk to some staff NCOs who like new staff NCOs who just came in and it's like, they just want to burn people. Yeah. You know, like paperwork, paperwork. Yeah. Like why? Like why yeah. are you giving this Marine paperwork? Well, yeah. because of the, like, dude, that's not like, you know, we did way worse than that. Yeah. Um, but we had very good, I had good leadership. Yeah. You know, I had great corporals. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of stupid shit. There's a story yeah. that's not in the book. Um, me and three other guys got arrested down in Jacksonville, Florida. Spent 14 days in jail. Oh, shit. And I'm at a PRP command, right? So we should have lost our PRP. We should have been, you know, kicked out. We, we could have uh, really fucked us. Um, but luckily the charges were dropped. Uh, we were stupid and, and took apart a Jeep. 
Yeah. Some guy's Jeep and a random guy in the parking lot cut us off, and we decided we were going to, you know, teach him a lesson. Some old lady in the apartment complex saw us drive up, lights off, called the police. And it was like uh, cops on location in Jacksonville, Florida. They just surrounded us, took us to jail. Luckily, the guy, like, had a sense of humor, and he was just like, nah, I'm not pressing charges. So, yeah. you know, we had to do community service. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was it. You know, we, we went yeah. back to the command, talked to them. Hey, look, like, would it have been worth it for you to lose your Marine Corps career over being stupid? Yeah. No. no. You know, so we got non rec for promotion for a couple months. Um, and that taught me a lot. Like, yeah. I grew up a lot, man. From, and, and, that's from, the, and that's the thing. And I'm glad that you brought that up because, like, I remember, like, when I was in, when I was in Afghanistan, before we got to Afghanistan, they gave you the opp opportunity to go home on leave for Christmas or you could just stay back on base and then your family could come and visit or whatever. We were on Lejeune. So a couple of the Marines decided they were going to stay back. Um, they were like four, four or five Marines. They all went out one night into, they all went out on base, uh, off base. Um, one of the guys was driving. The other three were in the, there was two guys in the car and then uh, the other ones met them out on, met them out at the bar or whatever they were at. And, they all end up getting drunk. Now, mind you, again, they're two separate parties, but they're friends. They know each other. And one's a sergeant. The rest of them, I believe, were corporals and a lance corporal. So what happens is, oh, no, they were all with three lance corporals, and then they met up with the sergeant. So they go out to this bar, and they get hammered drunk, and then the, the lance corporal thinks it makes sense to get back in his car and drive back on base. So he gets in the car, him and his two friends, they're all drunk. They drive on base. They get pulled over for being drunk they get um they get thrown thrown in jail and the sergeant it gets called and he gets um pretty much investigated on and he ends up getting after everything's said and done they njp the three lance corporals they njp the sergeant and they njp the sergeant because he was in the same bar right that was the reason that's ridiculous. you were there you didn't stop them what do you mean, bro? Yeah. Like, I wasn't even, like, hanging out with them. They were literally just three lance corporals. Yes, I know them. Yes, they're in my command. But they're grown-ass men that made a decision yeah. to get in the car and leave. And I'm going to get NJP'd because I didn't stop them. And then they – and then what, what was the worst about the whole situation is that this was right before deployment. So now these dudes are going out to Afghanistan as PFCs. So they just lost all of this money. And then on top of that, it ended up becoming a cycle. So this dude, one of the guys, his name was Cruz. He was a he was a corporal, my bad, and he was he had just gotten selected for sergeant. Yeah. So he was just gonna get promoted in like two two weeks, and he was just in the car. He wasn't even drunk driving; like he was just in the car, right. and he gets in trouble because he was in the car and he didn't stop them from drinking and he didn't stop the driver from drinking and all this shit. And then it becomes this whole entire debacle where they let him go on the deployment. Then he gets NJP'd again because he went to the, this, the sergeant major put him on restriction while in Afghanistan and was like, hey, you can't go to the PFs. You can only be in the cans. You can only be in the cans. And it's like, bro, I'm in the middle of Afghanistan. I already don't have my family here. I already don't have all these things going. And now you're telling me that I can't go to the store to buy a can of dip? So he said, fuck it. He went to the store, got NJP'd for not being on restriction. And this dude went from literally about to be a sergeant to leaving the Marine Corps as a PFC. That's ridiculous. And he went through his whole entire deployment. And this dude, dude, he had just gotten back from Iraq, volunteered to go to Afghan. And it's like, bro, for one bullshit mistake, you destroyed, destroyed this Marine's career. And what, to just make an example out of him? Yeah. And then it was, you know, and then I have another buddy, Forrest, who just got on recruiting duty. He was in, uh, I think he said Mexico. He got extremely drunk. Um, he got into a car that he thought was his. It wasn't his. So he got in trouble for breaking and entering in um, Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> and he gets arrested. And his command is like ready to fry him. Yeah. And luckily enough, his there were, it was either a first sergeant or a sergeant major who stopped it all. And he was like, bro, two weeks ago, he was your best sergeant. Right. He was your best Marine two weeks ago. And now he makes one mistake. Which was literally he added, and he and the thing was too, is that he came out and told the command he had gotten arrested, bailed himself out of jail. No one no ever one had to know. No one had to know what happened. But he, being the marine that he was, integrity, being above reproach, decided, hey, I'm going to tell my command. Yeah. 
And they were like, we're going to fry you. And the sergeant major was like, no. Like, you're a great Marine. You fucked up. You did something stupid. I'm going to throw your whole career away? Right. Like, no. We're, that's not going to happen. And, you know, and, and that's the thing is, like, there's so many people, and that's a huge part of the difference in timing, is back in the day, it could just be, you know what, hey, take it back to the tree line. Hey, go do this. Hey, extra duties, extra hours. Now it's like, no, page 11. No, paperwork, right. paperwork, paperwork. And it's like, why? Yeah. Like, everything doesn't have to be solved. Like, so, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Yeah, so, I, and, you know, and I try and explain that to a lot of Marines, too, is, you know, like, the, the shit that we did, and a lot of these, you know, happened way before you know so there was a we, we definitely put ourselves in a lot of bad situations um and, and luckily we had we had great leadership yeah. you know and, and we never had um issues I, I mean i have page 11s uh but you know did i deserve them yeah probably you yeah. know like um but i'm thankful i'm very thankful that everything worked out the way it did mm-hmm. um but yeah during you know during that time you know I, you know i did the typical you know lance corporal got married at, at 19 um, which was completely, you know, I should have listened to people. I should have listened to my NCOs and staff NCOs when they said, this is a bad idea. Like, you don't really, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. Um, but it was my first, like, real serious kind of girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, and that way, it was actually, you know, almost by mistake. Um, you'll, you will read a story in there about Scott. So Scott's my middle name. Mm-hmm. And we used to go out and we would, you know, go talk to girls. We'd make up names. And I would just, you know, I was Scott. You know, I would, in, you know, get introduced. Well, the girl that I ended up marrying, um, she was a Navy chief's daughter from the naval base. And she knew me as Scott. And as our relationship started getting stronger and, you know, longer, that's all she, she never knew my first name was Jesse, right? And How uh, long? The whole time. Well, up until right before we got married, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, it came down to this point where one of my good friends, uh, we were having the conversation, and, and I was like, dude, I don't, I don't really know what to do here, because we're starting to get a little serious, and you know, he said, he was like, look, this is a Navy Chief's daughter, man, you're going to have to stick this out, just stay as Scott until you, you guys break up, or you know, whatever, or until you, you, know, you rotate out and you leave, just ride it out, because you'll, you'll, you know, at that point as a, a PFC, Lance Corporal, you're, you're afraid of your, your corporals, yeah, you know, yeah. your sergeants. You're not going to, I don't want to fucking go see them and have to explain to this, yeah. you know. And uh, what ended up happening is um, my car warranty. Um, the, uh, the base, uh, we ended up getting, uh, uh, we lost a weapon. And it was uh, like Thanksgiving break. So we all got shut down. We were all getting ready to leave to go home. So I had planned on my first wife at the time before we got married. She was flying into Philadelphia um, to meet me so we could have Thanksgiving with my parents. So my mom, uh, my stepdad, my dad, my stepmom, they, they all go to the airport to meet her. And uh, she gets off the plane. You know, they recognize each other. They, you know, start talking. And um, she keeps calling me Scott, Scott. And my mom... You know, she says, this is, you know, I got home like the next day. And they're telling me this story and they were halfway down the terminal. She's finally like, who the hell is Scott? Like, did we pick up the wrong, you know, girl? And that was like the first like, oh shit. Okay, listen. Yeah, yeah, I I go by Scott. That's just what my friends, you know, call me. Um, But for, we were, so we ended up getting married and we were married for two years, but she called me Scott. So there's a lot of people that knew me from 90 you know four to 97 that only know me as scott Mm -hmm. you know so that was a you know it wasn't until after that that i you know after we got divorced that i went back to you know just being jesse yeah you know (laughs) um but there's a lot of guys from security forces that i talk to you know now that they're like like wait a minute i you know like i thought your name was scott like yeah "Yeah, man i look look i had to live this lie for like two years you know, because you're stupid at that time. Yeah. Just, like, yeah, well, it's no funny. It's funny that you say that because I have like a, a story of the same exact thing, but it was younger. So when I was a kid, I was just telling my buddy this yesterday. Um, so when I was a kid, I my first best friend, he's still one of my boys. His mom, he lived across the street from me in Brooklyn. 
And his mom comes over and she's like, hey, do you want to play with my son? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I introduce myself. I'm probably like eight or nine years old. I introduce myself as Alex. My name is Doug. Right. My middle name is Alexander William. So for whatever reason, I don't know why, I introduce myself as Alex. So I start hanging out with this kid, Matt. I start hanging out with his family. I become literally family. I'm at dinners. I'm at events. I'm at birthday parties like for years. And probably about, well, before that happens, probably about like six months into being friends, he comes over to my house. He knocks on the door. My dad answers the door. And he's like, hey, can Alex come out to play? My dad's like, who the fuck fuck is is Alex? Alex? (laughs) And he's just like, your son? And he's like, I don't have a son named Alex. And then his mom is like, wait, what? He's like, we've been playing. He comes outside every day. He's like, you mean Doug? Right. And his mom is like, wait a minute. So I come outside. I'm like, hey. And his mom's like, your name's Doug? I was like, oh, crap. And then, but I just kept it going. So they even kept it going. And then I ended ended up, he had friends in Staten Island. And I would go out with him to Staten Island to hang out. And I introduced all of them I'm Alex. Yeah. So then that whole, like the, all of Staten Island, all these 30, 40 people knew me as Alex and that went on forever. And then, and his family knew me as Alex. So then, um, all of a sudden one day he had a birthday party and his dad got a coach bus to go to, um, Six Flags and it was like 40, 50 people like his, they had money. Um, and they had like 40, 50 people on the bus. And one of my boys that I grew up with, Matt, this other Matt, um, Nako gets on the bus and everyone's like, yo, Alex, what's good? And Nako's like, who the fuck is Alex? And yeah. they're all like, him? And he, they're like, and, and Nako's like, no, his name's Doug. Yeah. And everyone's like, wait, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and now his, his, his parents still call me Alex. Um, his niece, his, his cousins, his grandmother before she passed away, Alex. His dad jokingly calls me Felix because he found out that like I had all these names, so he's like, I'm just gonna call you Felix. But yeah, I had the exact same thing happen for years. People I literally lived like years of my life as like Alex. Yeah. And and now I'm living as Benny, you know, who right. knows? In today's world you can de- identify as anything. Yeah. But um so what got you to writing the book? What was So this the purpose this book that? um it's good. Yeah, not really a complicated story, but so I actually came up with this book probably about fifteen, you know, twenty years ago. Mm. Um, so after I got divorced, I moved back to to Reading, uh, joined the reserve unit that was there. My best friend from high school, um, he had just gotten his degree, came back home, uh, and we lived together for a little while. And we would go out drinking, you know, we would go and have fun, and then um, he went into the Marines as an officer, and I came back on active duty. And uh, we had just, we would go out and just have, have fun, you know? Mm-hmm. And one day we're over drinks, we were talking about, hey, you know, like we should, you should write a book and put all your stupid stories in, in, in this book. And uh, I said, I was like, look, like who, who the fuck wants to read a book like this? Who's going to, who wants to read a book about, you know, at this time I was, I think a sergeant. Um, I just did a lap move into artillery. He was an artillery officer. So we were at Fort Sill together. Like, Dave, who, who's going to read a story about a, a sergeant, you know, who likes strippers? Like, nobody's going to read that book. That wasn't, you know, a big thing. Um, and we talked about it for years. So we end up, um, I came back out. He did station in uh, Camp Lejeune at the Combined Arms Staff Trainer. And I went down. My second wife at the time was a reservist. She gets mobilized for 9-11. My unit was, we were tasked with, we were supposed to support the initial push. And uh, we didn't. They, I had a conversation with my ops chief, and he was like, yeah, we're, look, we're not going. You know, we're, we got bumped. And I was pissed. And I'm talking to Dave, and he was like, dude, come down here. I'll, I can get you in the cash trainer. Come down there. And then we both ended up going to Iraq at the same time. He was in Blue Diamond. I was on Ed Fallujah. Um, and then we got back. We started this tradition. Like every Friday, we would go out. We would just bullshit. We would talk about stories. We would just have fun. Got divorced the second time. And uh, the the stories kind of started amping. Like now we had money. We're older. You know, the bars turned into Hooters and strip clubs and, you know, whatever. And uh, it kind of grew from there. Dude, we got to write. You got to write these stories. Got to write these stories. But I never really had a why. Mm-hmm. Like, why? Why would somebody want to read this bullshit? Yeah. 
Um, and uh, about a year and a half ago, right when like COVID started, I was enjoying the time off. I was working from home, teleworking. I was having a blast. I was doing stupid dad jokes. Um, I was, you know, pulling pranks, scaring my my family. Like I I had a blast. And obviously not everybody had that. Like, you know, it affected everybody differently. And I started seeing it. You know, people were upset. Um, my next door neighbor, um, her brother was in the Navy, ended up committing suicide oh, wow. across the street where they grew up. Oh, wow. And, man, like it started in this rash. Had, a, had three or four Marines that we were friends with that committed suicide. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, you know, this is like, man, like how do you, how do you fix this? What, do you, what can I do mm-hmm. to help this yeah started listening to podcasts um talking to different people and um one of the reservists that i was with um from 2008 to 2010 he reminded me of a story when we were in san antonio and uh, i shared it i shared it on my facebook page and people loved it had a bunch of marines that were calling me texting me Hey, like this was fucking, this was awesome. It reminded me about a story, you know, whatever. And they were telling me stories. Mm -hmm. And then they were telling me like, I had to, after I read that, I had to go reach out to another Marine that I served with to talk about, you know, this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, like if I could do something like this, I could get these stories Mm -hmm. and put them into something, you know, and if it would make people laugh or it connects somebody to somebody else. And if you can do a buddy check out of that, Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? You know what? I like this idea. Yeah. I think I'm gonna I'm going to start with a, um, you know, a dedication. I have the dedication yeah, yeah, page yeah. on on like all that. the you know, service members. And that was kind of my why. Like I finally had a purpose of, you know what? If if, if this book helps one person, yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, you know. Um, so it kind of went from there. And I mean, it it took me a little while to to get everything down, um, and I had to, you know, I wanted it perfect. Like I wanted the dedication page to be perfect. Um, trying to get the stories from Marines was a little bit harder because this was something that nobody's ever really done before. Hey, look, I want you to tell me your funniest story that you tell at the bar or, you know, whatever. Um, I've never been to Okinawa or Thailand, mm-hmm. so I knew the stories because we talked about them yeah, at the bar. Yeah, yeah, You always heard them. And, uh, you know, I called up a couple friends. I'm like, look, I want you to uh, give me your story for the book. Like, look, man, that was... 20 years ago, I'm married, I have kids, I don't want, I can't, I can't do that. So that was a little bit harder, you know, trying to get all this, the stories right. But, um, yeah, once I, you know, people started commenting, you know, on, on different stories and different stuff that I was posting, um, it really became this, what it is right now. Yeah. I like the way you, I like the way that you started it off with the safety brief. I like that. Um, One of the things I wanted to ask you, so in the book, in the beginning, in the safety brief, you had mentioned that somebody had said that this could hurt the recruiting command. What was the, so that's my thing, is I enjoy this because of the fact that we, we don't stop Vet TV from making movies. We don't stop the normal world from making movies. Yeah. So why is it wrong that a Marine writes a book about what happens in the Marine Corps? So when you look at... Like vet TV, I've watched a little bit of it. I don't, I just don't have enough time to watch TV and yeah. pay for services. But I've watched some of it. Some of it's fucking funny. Yeah. And um, when you look at the stuff that's on TV and movies, it's not reality. It's yeah. TV. It's yeah. it's TV shows. And Marines, you know, we're known for being professionals. You know, everybody knows when you ask somebody, you know, about a Marine. Like, tell me some things about Marines. You know, where you know, oh, they have tattoos. They drink. They go to strip clubs. You know, that's all shit that's out of any main gate anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. But you don't really hear the stories about them. Exactly. You know, it, it's and if you look on if you look on any you know Amazon and you look up stories about the military, it's all honor, courage, commitment. Yeah. Right. And that's kind of where most people, especially the older generations, mm-hmm. you know, they don't want don't ever do anything that's going to make the Marine Corps look bad. Mm-hmm. So I kind of struggled with that a little bit. Um, you know, is this something that I'm going to really like? You know, obviously, this is not going to be on the, the, the Commandant's reading list, you know, um, but. But see, like, that's my, but that's my argument, though. Like, why, why couldn't it be? Right. Because the yeah. reality of it is, like, again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong. Like, clearly, the Commandant's reading list, the books that we read, you know, reading Brute, reading all these different books, you know, like, 
you know, about camaraderie, about the, the amazing things that history, you know, we've done in the Marine Corps. Great things. But the thing that no one highlights is this. This is the yeah. stuff that nobody talks about. Right. And it's the stuff that people say maybe you shouldn't be talking about. But that's the thing that, like, you know, like, because when you think about it, like, when, when I was a recruiter, people would be like, oh, bro, I don't want to join the Marine Corps. All I do is march around and walk around all day and say and salute people and say, aye, sir. Yeah. It's like, no, that's not it at all. Yep. Like, we have memories. We do things like this. and But at the same time, like you said in the safety brief in the beginning, this can also be in place of some bullshit slideshow. Like, hey, Marines, I'm going to read a, a segment of this book for you to not go and tell because I don't want you to have this story. Don't yeah. go be stupid. Don't get three DUIs. Don't go do this, this, and the third. You know, because... And that's part of why I started my podcast was because nobody – there's so much stuff that nobody talks about. And then there's also so much stuff that people feel like they can't relate to. But now they can because they right. can pick up this book and be like, oh, shit, I'm not the only one. And then, yeah. like you said, one story – like I read the one story about the recruiter. Like that shit was hilarious. Uh, yeah. Like yep. the first – like one of the very first ones in the book. I was like, bro, I don't know why the hell I never thought about right. that. Like – and, bro, like, we used to do the same thing, man. I used to get kids all day on piss tests. Like, I remember this one time I bugged out. I flipped out on this dude. So I go on this entire – this kid walks in with his dad. Um, kid sits down immediately talking about how he wants to join the Marine Corps and this, this, and the third. And the dad's, like, just – oh, dad was, like, all on board. And we do, like, an hour and a half interview with the kid. And I keep asking the kid in front of his dad. I'm like, hey, man. You know, if this is something you want to do, like, we're going to have to drug test you. We're going to have to do this, this, and the third. He's like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't do drugs. Dad's like, no, he doesn't do drugs. And I'm like, okay. So we go through the whole interview, and I was the boss at the time. So I tell the, I look at the dad, I'm like, hey, sir. I was like, we're going to, if, you know, your son's saying he wants to join the Marine Corps, I was like, we're going to have to get the paperwork and everything done. I was like, but, you know, due to HIPAA, due to all these things, we really can't have you present while doing the paperwork because it's his. Um, and there's a lot of confidentiality clauses, so we just got to do everything with him. So if it's okay with you, we can either, you know, call you to have you come back to pick him up, yep. or we can just drop him off. And Dad's like, oh, I'll, you know, I got some shopping to do. I'll go down the street to do some shopping. I'm like, all right, well. So Dad leaves. What do I do? I hand the kid a bottle. We start the paperwork. And, and I felt this overcoming sensation. And I tell the recruiter, I'm like, hey, bro, we should, get the, we should do this drug test quick. He's like, nah, bro, he's good, he's good, he's good. I'm like, I'm like, okay. So he does the whole paperwork, the whole package, and finally the kid does a drug test. Dude, this kid popped for like <laughs> six different things on this drug test. Uh, yeah. And I'm and I literally came out and I didn't I didn't tell him. I just opened it. I was like, So, you gonna tell me? And I was like, Are you gonna say anything? He's like, No, what? I'm like, bro, there's no way you're going to still sit here and lie to me. Yeah. He's like, all right, well, I didn't want my dad to know. And I'm like, dude, first of all, your dad left an hour and a half ago, bro. I was like, you just waste my fucking time. I blasted this dude like he was like a piece of shit. PFC. I blasted this dude, this grown-ass man, probably like 28, 99. I blasted the shit out of him. I was like, you wasted my fucking time. You wasted my recruiter's time. I was like, you're all fucking drugged up sitting in here talking about how you want to change your life. I bugged the fuck out on him. And then he, he his dad comes walking in. And I was like, so are you going to tell him or do I have to? And he was just like, "Yeah." I was like, sir, your son can't be a Marine. And his dad was like, why? I was like, sir, that's not my conversation to have. Yep. Y'all can have it in the car. Have a good day. And the kid left, never came back. And it was just like, bro, like, dude, there's so many, like, there, here's another story. I told this on an episode, but I didn't release it because it got lost. So I did this episode with my, boy, my buddy, uh, Rassiope. He's a Marine. He has a podcast. And uh, we got into the conversation, but somehow I don't know what happened, but the recording got lost. But um, so one of my, my boy, Mo, this is his first kid he ever put to MEPS. Like the first kid that was ever supposed to join the Marine Corps. Can't, I can't remember the kid's name, but my boy Mo, me and my me and my gunny still laugh about this shit because it's like, bro, this shit, there's no way this shit happened. Like, telling the story and realizing that it's a real story is crazy. So, this recruiter hits a, uh, grabs the kid, puts him in the car, brings him to Meps, drops him off at the hotel. The next morning, the kid gets up, gets on the bus to go to the ho to go to Meps. All of a sudden, it's like 5:30, 5:45 in the morning. 
I'm the A gunner, so I'm getting a call from the the MEPS liaison, the Gunny. I think it was Gunny Ledbetter at the time, and or it was Gunny Odenbright. I don't remember which one. But he starts chewing my ass up. He's like, "Get your fucking recruiter up here." I'm like, "Gun." I'm like, "Gunny, what happened? What happened?" He's like, "Get your fucking recruiter up here with a change of clothes and some goddamn underwear." And I'm like, "What?" I'm like, "What? The, what happened, Gunny?" I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Don't. I don't have time for this shit. Just get him up here." I'm like, "Okay, okay, okay." So I call my boss. I'm like, "Gunny Arama." I'm like, "Yo, Gunny, so and so just called me, and he's bugging the fuck out." That he needs us to get up there with the change of clothes and underwear. And that our kid's not going to be able to go on deck. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell is going on. So he's like, alright, I'll call him. So he calls the gunny. He So finally we find out that this dude got on the bus. And he somehow shit himself. Oh, shit. He shit himself. Yeah. And he shit himself all over. Oh. Like he was sitting in the back of the bus. Shit himself. He's got shit all over his trousers, shit all over his shirt. The dude, for whatever reason, thought that it made sense. And mind you, I guess like now as I tell the story, it's like I don't know what I would have done if I was in his right. shoes. But he took off his pants and his underwear, and he threw them out the window of the bus on the Garden State Parkway. <laughs> now, mind you, so now this dude's sitting butt-ass naked in the back seat of the bus. Yeah. And mind you, his ID... And his social were in his pants. Right. So now he can't get on base. He can't get in the MEPS because he doesn't have identification. So he threw his pants out? So he threw threw his pants and his underwear out the bus. So then they had to somehow backtrack and find Find his clothes on the parkway so they could get him on, like, all this shit, literally. And um, and then they call us bugging out, like, bro, is this isn't, like, what? I could have controlled this? (laughs) Like, there's something that I could have done to to (laughs) change this? Long story short, the kid ended up miserably failing the ASVAB. He got hit by but for something, and like, dude, it was just it. Was, and this was the first kid my my boy Morales ever put like on deck to join the Marine Corps. Dude, he was like, how could how was that the first kid? Right, he's like, no joke. He's like, that's how this starts. Like, this yes. is how my Marine Corps recruiting command recruiting story starts. Is my first kid I ever put on deck shits himself. Right, and it was dude, it was hilarious. Like he literally. And then and we went to we went to all hands and everyone's like oh so I heard your kid shit himself and it became like this huge thing yeah. and it dude it was dude, recruiting duty like I gotta give you stories to put in the book just I, I could do you could do a whole entire book about recruiting stories oh yeah absolutely because dude the stupidest shit happens bro yeah. like one time um what this shit I'll never forget bro so I'm sitting there in the office and my boy so my gunny would say this shit all the time. He'd be like, when he was screening the kid, he'd be like, hey, man, so you good? He's like, you got all t- all 11 toes. You got, you know, both left nuts. And, you know, you got both nuts. And, and this kid, he would always say that. He would always say that before we got on the kid on the bus, before we got the kid in the car. And one day, we're about to get this kid in the car. We're getting inspected by the, uh, by the commanding officer. And um, the commanding officer's just like, it's, I'm the kid. You're the recruiter. We're sitting at the desk going over the paperwork and there's like a little um like a we had like the, they have like bulletproof like walls yep. that you go throughout the office and the ceo was on the other side of the wall and he's just sitting there like this and i'm over here and the gunny's over here and the ceo is just sitting there like this just going through some paperwork or whatever like pretending not to be there and the gunny goes the gunny goes Hey man, so you you ready to go, man? He's like, I looked through all your paperwork. He's like, everything's good. He's like, yes, yeah, yes, sir, it's, everything's good. And he goes, all right, man. So, you know, you got both nuts. And the kid looks up at him and goes, No, I only have one. <laughs> and the CEO's the CEO's face just goes, <laughs> and he just looks at me and the gunny, and the gunny's just like, Nah, man, come on, stop playing. And the kid's like, No, I, I only have one. And he's like, Wait a minute, what? And he opens up the paperwork. He opens up the medical portion. He's like, bro, you see right there, number whatever it says, but has both testicles. Right. He's like, oh, I must have missed that because I only have one testicle. Oh. And we're like, and now mind you, this kid's supposed to be Same at day. MEPS yeah. in like the next hour. So now, luckily enough, we already had the commanding officer in the room. So we, had, we could explain to him. But at the same time, it's still like now, now the office has to explain to the recruiting instructor why was this a thing? How did you miss this during screening? 
And now we have to explain to the commanding officer, like, bro, what? And the kid just didn't, I guess the kid didn't feel comfortable enough bringing it up. And, right. and, 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 and honestly, like, since that moment, it always became a screening question of mine. Like, before I would even interview a kid, I'd be like, you got both nuts? And he'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, are you sure? Because I don't want to get to Mebson all of a yeah. sudden, and that shit happens, bro. Yep. And and apparently it's and, and I never knew this, but on the on the duty I find out that it's actually a common thing that a lot of people, you know, either it doesn't drop at birth, right, or it never drops, or like there was a guy who I know who um was squatting and his nut burst, burst. and he lost his nut, so he only has one left nut. Um, but you can still join the Marine Corps with one last nut. That Marine ended up, you know, that kid became a Marine. But, it, dude, it was just hilarious, like, how the whole entire situation went yeah. down. We were like, wait, what? And, like, you know, it's just crazy, dude. The, the And that's why I'm glad that I, you know, I picked up your book. I'm glad that you wrote the book. Because it's just a place to, you know, to find camaraderie in. And especially in a time like this where, like, COVID and people not being able to get together and stuff, you're able to... Read a read somebody else's story, yeah. reminisce with people you've never met, and you know it's a it hits home because there's so many stories you never hear, and it's also like one of the reasons why I started the podcast, kind of similar to what you're saying, is that one day the people that that are in this book, all the stories that are in this book, they're going to be gone. Yep. But their stories won't be gone because they're here in the book. Yeah. You know. And that's something that'll transcend you, it'll transcend them, and it'll be passed on through generations, yeah. and, you know. And I also just like the way, I've only gotten, like, I think a page 30 in, um, but I just like how, you know, you familiarize yourself with them, um, and they're just funny stories. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, with the stories, you know, as Marines, you could, like, I've never been in recruiting. Yeah. But we would be able to sit down at a bar and find something that we have in common. Yeah. And you'd still be able to tell stories, mm -hmm. right? Or like, you know, as you as a recruiter, you're reading some of the recruiter stories and you could completely relate. Yeah. And, you know, it may be so-and-so, this story by, mm -hmm. but you could put your name on there. Yeah. You know, like there's stories in there from, you know, if they if you didn't know it was in Thailand, mm -hmm. I could put my name like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That happened to me. Yeah, like, yeah. absolutely. Um, and that was kind of the, the nice thing about it. Yeah. it you know, as, as all of us, there's so many stories in there that we can all completely relate to. Yeah. Um, but I, and I think that that's part of what the Marine Corps is missing, you know, in today's Marine Corps. Um, because, and that's another reason why I started my podcast, another reason why I, saw, I try to do what I do, is because now there should always be a reverence for the person who's above you, right? Corporal, sergeant, sergeant Absolutely. major, not saying there shouldn't be. But at the same time, I feel like the command is so far apart from their troops. Because, like, when you do these safety briefs, you know, instead of it just being a PowerPoint, or instead of, you know, when you do an alcoholism awareness class, or when you do a suicide awareness class, what is it? It's a click through PowerPoint. Yep. No one cares. Hey, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be at wherever. Sign my name on it. And it becomes nothing. But when you actually sit there and have a, give a class, and not even give a class. First of all, it shouldn't even be a class. It should be just be a conversation amongst right. men, amongst females, men, women, you know, Marines. And it should just be a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Like, listen, bro, I'm, you know, I remember um, Sergeant Major Woodard. <clears throat> one of, he just retired. He's back in Texas. But he was um, the RS Sergeant Major from New Jersey. And the one thing that I appreciated about him was he was open about all of his issues he would straight out tell you that there was times where he contemplated suicide and he's a sergeant major yeah he's like bro i've i've sought help i've got help and i've been able to retire he's like bro i drink whiskey all the time he's like i had issues with alcoholism i had issues with this i've been divorced i have children I, or a daughter like he would he would come out and the thing too was and you know like, for me, one thing that I always appreciated about him is that when he would come over... So, I had two very distinct, different sergeant majors. For him, I had another sergeant major. Won't say his name. I love the dude. Great guy. But when I would walk into my office at 8 a.m., he would unexpectedly show up. He wouldn't tell anybody he was showing up. And you would open the door, and he would be sitting in the corner <laughs> with his legs like this. And you'd be like, bro, what are you doing? Like, bro, it's 7.30 in the morning. It's yeah. dark. You didn't turn the lights on. 
And it's like, why are you doing that? Like, that's weird, bro. Right. And then he, and then if you didn't give him the proper greeting of the day, it would become this huge thing. And it's like, bro, what the hell? Then you meet this guy who takes over for him, a completely different dude. He walks in your office. He's like, hey, what's going on, brother? And it's like, and that was my, my always thing. It's like, I, I completely understand the proper greeting of the day. I understand those things. But if you see me first, why can't you say good morning to me? Absolutely. Like, why can't it be both? Like we're brothers, we're we're in the same branch, we're you know supposed to be family, and like we don't relate to one another. And again, I t- completely understand reverence and all that, but a lot of the reason why Marines feel the way they do is because they can't talk up right. at all. And I under- and then you have those people who say, hey, you know, um, open door policy, but did you go to so and so? Right. Well, then you don't have an open yeah. door policy, yeah, yeah, bro. Exactly. Like yeah. don't like I had like when I checked into my new unit. This this dude, um, I think he uh, he wasn't the commanding officer, but he was like the battalion commander, and he literally was like, "Listen, I have a, an open door policy, but you better fucking have gone through your chain of command before you reach my door." Well, then you don't have an open door policy. Yeah. You just contradicted what you said, Absolutely. bro. And at this point in your life, I don't understand that we have PFCs that think that they can just go talk to whoever they want to, but at the same time. Nine times out of ten, if someone felt they could go talk to you, it's because they couldn't talk to anybody else. Right. You know what I mean? And I think that with your book and with the, what I'm trying to do and what people are trying to do is that, you know, we're just trying to make sh- people understand that we've all been in the same place. And that's the problem is so yeah. many people forget where they come from. You know, like talking to them, like on recruiting duty or the drillers of the field or wherever it is, people forget that w- there was a day where you were a shitbag PFC. You weren't always a great Marine, bro. Absolutely. Like, but people forget that. They yeah. think that they're the stellar Marine, and it's like, no, bro, you probably fucked up sometime too, but you don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Like, no. Yeah. And, you know, and for the whole time that I've um, been in the Marines, I mean, just in my personality, I love talking to people. I love getting to know people. Yeah. Um, you know, finding something that we have in common that you can, you can talk to. Right. And, um, you know, even, you know, as a gunny, uh, when I checked into the uh, my last unit uh, reserve, the reserve battery in Reading, um, you start you know talking to these these kids who are you know young and they don't really know about deployments or they don't know about active duty and they don't you know whatever, um, and they all have their own issues. Yeah. And you know they'll kind of look at you a little weird when you're like, "Hey man, what's going on? How you doing? Yeah. How's your family? Tell yeah. me about yourself." Yeah. Well, uh, you know, well, I don't know what to really say to you yeah. right now, Gunnery Sergeant. It's like, yo. Listen, man, we'll yeah. talk to me. I know. What's going dude, on? And that's the thing, and that's the fucking problem. Yeah. Like, listen, bro, I get it. I understand it, and I, I'm glad that you're saying that, especially from somebody, I don't want to call you an old head, but, like, coming from somebody who is in the, you know, older Marine Corps, talking to somebody who's in the current Marine Corps, I love the fact that you agree with that because that's the reality of it, is that there's no reason. Like, now, mind you, I'm not saying that a PFC should walk up to a gunny and be like, hey, yo, what's good, gunny? Right. I'm not saying that. But there's no reason why a gunnery sergeant can't say, hey, man, how are you? Right. How is everything? What's going on? Especially because, like, and we wonder why the suicide rate is the way it is, is because, like, when you think about it, when was the last time you asked your Marine, what's going on at home? The dude doesn't live at home. Yeah. You don't know if his mom's dying from cancer. Right. You don't know if his, you know, his brother, his cousin, or whoever, or any of these things are going on. You know fucking nothing about this dude's life because you don't ask him. Because you're not his immediate squad leader. Right. And then your thought is, oh, well, I don't need to know his squad leader knows. No, you should know your Marines and what's Absolutely. going on with them. And that's the problem, is that if they, and, and we say, hey, man, I'm here for you. Hey, man, if you need me, call me. And then when you call them at 2.30 in the morning, hey, why the fuck are you calling me at 2.30 in the morning? You know you you, you told me that I could call you if I needed to. Yeah. You know, wait, what? Absolutely. And that's the thing is, that, and then you have these Marines who feel like they can't come to you. And then, you know, and I, and I, was, I brought this up before, but like I had this exact thing happen to me. I had a Marine call me, um, tell me he was thinking about committing suicide. So I got up, I talked to him on the phone, talked to him on the phone, probably like two, three hours, like talking to him on the phone. And um, I told him at the end of the phone call conversation, I was like, hey man, listen, like, just so you know, I'm going to have to notify the command because you called me and told me this, like, I got to make sure that I tell them what's going on with you. He was like, no, I understand that. And so I called the command 
and I call I called the first sergeant. It was like three in the morning, and his and his first thing was, "Why are you calling me at three in the morning?" Right. Why the fuck are you asking me why I'm yeah. calling Obviously you I'm at calling three a.m., bro? It's important. Yeah, like I'm you not know? calling yeah. you to say, "Hey, what's going on, Mike? How are you?" No, motherfucker, I'm calling you because there's an issue, and you told me if I needed to call you to call you. Yeah. So I called the dude, um, and I'm like, "Hey, first sergeant, you know, so and so just called me. He's contemplating su- committing suicide." The next thing he says to me is, why did he call you? What's the matter? Why the fuck do you care, bro? Right. And then we ended up getting to drill, and we ended up having conversations, and he again says to me, you know, I'm trying to understand why you've had three or four Marines call you saying they're con- contemplating suicide. Trust. I was like, because they fucking trust me? Right. Because I have a relationship yeah, with absolutely. them? absolutely. Because when something happens to them, I go to their house? Because when I see a Facebook status that they made, I call them immediately to see if they're okay. I was like, the question shouldn't be, why are they calling me? The question should be, why the fuck aren't they calling you? That yeah. should be the question. Yep. And then the fact that you're mad at me because they called me? Like, and that's the problem. You know, and every, when I, I was just a guest on a podcast the other day, and I had a Marine reach out. Uh, one of the questions that the guy asked me was, how do we, you know, combat suicide? Or how do we stop it? First of all, the answer is we don't. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Right. It's going to, unfortunately, suicide is going to happen, right? But the question is, how do we lessen it, right? Yeah. And the reality of it is doing what we're doing right now. The reality of it is is that when you say, hey, man, I'm here for you, then fucking be there. Like, right. if you, it don't, if, if, if you say, hey, give me a call if you need me, then answer your phone when I call you. Or just reach out. Yeah. Like, that's the thing, too. Is that, you know, if you really think about it, like I, I said this the other day on my, on my live feed, bro, I have 750 contacts in my phone. And, not, and literally, if you scroll down my phone, it's all from the rank of private to fucking sergeant major yeah. and colonel and whatever. And it's like, but then I look at it and I'm like, how many of those people, if I called them right now, would they answer? And or would they call me back? Right. Or would it be days before they realized I called? And that's the thing. If you really want to talk about stopping suicide or lessening the blow it's not about doing 22 push-ups a day it's about doing things that are going to change everything reaching out to people calling people you know um asking them just the simple question how are you how is everything because and then that's the thing too is you don't know when it, when it's going to happen you know like there's people that if someone was telling me that he literally um i was talking to a marine the other day and he said that he was on the phone on the Marine Corps birthday with somebody, and the Marine said happy birthday to him, and then hung up the phone and killed himself. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And he was like, bro, I just was on the phone with him and said happy birthday, Marine Corps, boom, 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 and now this dude just killed himself. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck, man? And it's like, you know, could we have seen the signs? Could we have done more? And the reality of it is is that I would rather do too much than be told I did not sure. enough. You know, and that's why, bro, I FaceTime everybody all the time. And people are like, my buddy Master R.D. is, why are you calling me right now? Just to say hi. Like, the fuck? Yeah. And he's like, <sighs> And I'm just like, bro, I'm just calling you to say, what up, Master R? I'm like, yeah. that's it. But that's it, you know? I, and, and I feel like there's so many people that just feel like they can't do that, you know? Or, yeah, I remember. So I was on, um, I was at Camp Lejeune, and I was the staff hand, COIC, of the Combined Arms Staff Trainer. And um, we were part of SOTG, and my sister unit, uh, which is a building, um, had a staff sergeant that was there, and he was going on, it was over Thanksgiving, and he was getting ready to go on vacation, like, out of the country. So he was like, hey, look, do you mind, you know, keep an eye on my guys? And I really knew, like, I knew them, small talk, you know, here and there, and they would come down and, and help our building. And he was like, hey, listen, I got to tell you, my one Marine, he's on suicide watch. Like, he's allowed to go on on you know leave for thanksgiving you know but we're worried about him all right you know cool so we got together when we were doing our um the leave chits and stuff at sotg and i kind of pulled him aside and i said like hey like what's going on like what are your plans what are you gonna do you're not like gonna sit in the fucking barracks for a week are you right because that's you know no and he was like staff sergeant uh i'm i have a girlfriend um, she's from Ohio. Uh, I'm getting ready to go see her and her family. Like I'm, I'm getting really serious. Um, this is a good thing in my life. It's making me happy. Um, I, he 
awesome. All right, check in with me every couple of days. Let me know, you know, what's going on. I'll give you a call. And but I was worried about him, and I don't. I mean, this isn't my marine. Yeah. You know, I barely know him, but I was concerned. Like he's a person. Yeah, and absolutely. He's a marine. <laughs> and uh, so we got back from from uh, Thanksgiving, and I talked to him, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm like, hey, you know, how was your thing? I was great. I got to spend time with her, her family, you know, all this stuff. We're gonna get married." Like, dude, awesome. Like, I'm I'm glad everything's looking up for you, right? Christmas leave comes around. I'm on leave. And I get a phone call. And now I didn't even think about suicide. Like, this kid, you're good, all right, everything's good. Staff Star calls me. And I was like, I saw the, and I'm like, why the fuck is he calling me right now? Everybody's on leave. And I pick up the phone, and he was like, you're not going to believe this. And the first thing I thought of was, ah, oh, fucking this kid killed himself, right? Mm-hmm. So... He didn't, right? So he goes, goes home, goes to Ohio. The girl that he's seeing is underage. Parents find out. So he actually gets the girl to climb out of a window, get into a car, and he takes her into Pennsylvania. FBI gets involved because he's going across straight lines. So he gets ended up getting pulled over, arrested. And I'm just like, what just happened here? Like, I, this kid was on suicide watch. Everything is great. He's got a girlfriend. Well, nobody asked him, like, real questions about his girlfriend. Like, yeah. you know, and, I mean, that's not something you typically do. But, man, I was just like, like, holy shit. Like, how how does none of his other Marines, how do they not, how are they not looking into, like, the stuff that this kid's doing? He's yeah. on suicide watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are they not really trying to connect with this kid to find out yeah. what's going on? How can we help him? What can yeah. we do? Yeah. To the point where you know now he's in prison, you know. Yeah. Um, and I've always tried to, you know, connect with all of the Marines, you know, in in some way or another to find out. Even you know my officers that you know we were with. Um, I never had a. Um, I I was never that person who, you know, I'm a, I'm a staff NCO and I'm going to treat you like this. Or I'm going to yeah. treat you like. I mean, we all put our our fucking trousers yeah. on the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a lieutenant right before we deployed to Iraq, ended up getting a DUI. Mm-hmm. So he got to go on deployment with us. And the first question I said was like, sir, why the fuck didn't you call me? You could have, given, when his truck was in, he drove off into a ditch. Why didn't you call me? What were you going to do? I would have fucking drove my ass down there, sat with your fucking truck until the police came and said I was driving because I'm fucking sober. Like, why would you do that? I'm an officer. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, you know, that's that's what we do. We look after each other. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of always the way I've been. That's why, I mean, I have a lot of friends in the Marines, you know, that, that I still talk to and, you know, guys that were, you know, corporals when I was a gunny 10, 15 years ago, they still call me gunny, yeah. you know, but we still talk and we talk about our families, our kids, but you, you know, know we what's talk so about all that weird. Stuff. It's, it's a lot of it's because that you were in the reserve program. Yeah. Because, and, and I hate to say that, but it's the reality of it. Because like when I was when I when I transitioned to active duty as a recruiter, and I would tell people the way that the reserve program worked, they'd be like, "Wait a minute, what?" Because I would be like, as a reservist, think about it. Like you go to the same hotel, you yeah. all have billeting. I'm gonna be at the same bar as the sergeant major and the CO, yeah. and I may call him Scott, even as a yeah. corporal or a sergeant. And then tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be like, say, good, "Hey, good morning, Captain. Yeah. Good morning, sir." But we have that understanding. And that's how I was brought up in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, Lance Corporal, at 1800, when we get off a drill and we go at the bar, yeah. you can call me whatever the hell you want to call me, but tomorrow morning at formation, you better call me sergeant. Yep. And that became a thing. And it was always expected. It never became anything different than that. It never became like, oh, dude, oh, dude, I thought we were boys. Like, I thought, no, motherfucker. Like, work is work and after work is Absolutely. after work. But, like, the active duty program, to my understanding, doesn't allow that to happen at all and that's also why there's such a huge gap in between it is because you don't ever have those conversations yep. like you don't like think about it like while i was on recruiting duty <laughs> excuse me i had so many com I, I spoke to a major every single day as a staff sergeant on active duty that doesn't happen right you know i spoke to a master guns all of the time I spoke to master sergeants all of the time, sergeant majors all of the time. But in the Marine Corps, on active duty, you don't ever yeah. even see them. And I understand the purpose of all, the, all that, but like at the end of the day, you can't say, well, what did we do? How could we have changed this? 
if nobody even knows who you are. Right. Like, you weren't even a link in the chain. Like, you were just there. And then you say, oh, I feel bad. But do you, though? Yeah. Like, what could you have done to help out? And I think that's why, like, I love, like, I have other, that's why I love social media, though. Because, like, I follow a lot of sergeant majors who, like, I have a gunny, uh, but one of, one of my good friends, Gunny, uh, Gunny Duran, deployed with him to Afghanistan. Um, he just got off the drill field. He's out in Hawaii. And, like, he's out on a training op, and he's posting pictures of his Marines getting promoted. He's there at the formation. He's, po- you know, Marine of the Quarter, Marine of this. And he's boasting about them. He's talking about them. Yeah. And it's like, that's the shit that has to happen. You know, and I had, there was this um, this guy on social media, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Major Bull. Yep. So I followed a lot of his stuff, and one of the things that he had shared yesterday was a video that he had shared, like, I guess, while he was on active duty before he retired, and it was about awards. And he was talking about the fact that people say, well, we, we give out too many awards, and because we give out too many awards, they lose their meaning. And he's like, well, then what the fuck's the point of the yeah, award? Exactly, yeah. And that's the problem, is that, like, you have so many Marines who go above and beyond and do above and beyond their job, and they don't get recognized for it. And it's not that they do it to be recognized. They do it because that's just who they are as a person. You know, like, I didn't go above and beyond contracting for any other reason besides the fact of the state of New Jersey needs contracts. That's my job. I'm supposed to do that job. I'm going to do that job to the best of my ability. Now, is it awesome that I got two NAMs and a Navy Com out of it? Fuck yeah. But... There were so many other people who did the same amount of work and didn't get any. Right. You know? And then there's guys like right now. I'm not going to lie. I laughed my ass off because my Navy comm was four years of work. I saw a com. uh, I recently heard of a dude who got a Navy comm for, you know, over shipping. And it's like, (laughs) I did that every month for four years. Right. And this dude got like, and that's why it's like, I understand it, but at the same time, it's like we, you know, I understand where the sergeant major was coming from, where sometimes, yeah, they're, you know, if we do just hand them out, we're handing them out, but if, but we have to be able to reward Marines because of the fact that they are doing above and beyond. Mm -hmm. And when you don't, then people literally become senior lance corporals who are like, bro, why do I care when nobody gives a fuck when I do go out of my way? You know, why do I care? If we're going to be here till 21, 2200. And that's the other thing, too. You know, you talk about suicide and you got Marines who are at work until 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. And you're like, what yeah. can we do to change that? Right. Well, then send them the fuck home, bro. Right. Like I went I went to Lejeune um, and I have a whole bunch of Marines that I put in the Marine Corps that are on Lejeune. So I figured, hey, I'm going to be there for the week. I'll be able to get dinner with them. I'll be able to go out with them. And I start hitting them all up, and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to be out of work till 11 o'clock tonight. I was like, why? And they were just like, mm, I don't know. This is just how it is. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. And they're like, nothing. And I'm like, but you're at work. They're in their, exactly. they're in their barracks room playing PlayStation because they don't fucking have a, a training plan to actually do something. Yeah. Yeah, or, well, no. One of the guys that I hit up, my buddy uh, Robbie McCann, he was at the motor pool in the, in the bay. And I'm like, well, when are you going to go home? He's like, they won't let us leave. He said, they'll, they, they'll tell us when they tell us. Yeah. And I'm like, this happens? He's like, every day. He's like, we ne-. he's like I don't work 8 a.m. to 5. He's like, I work until they just decide, hey, it's time to go home. And then and I'm like, hey, but yet you wonder why you have an alcohol rate, of, you know, a ridiculous alcohol yeah. rate. You wonder why you have a suicide rate. You wonder Divorce why all these things. Yeah. yeah, it's Absolutely. like you, these Marines aren't going home to their families, but yet you want them to be successful. Like what? Yeah, and it's yeah. And you know, and the funny thing is, you see that, and you know that it happens on active duty, and you know, like as a lance corporal, you're like, you know what? If I get to the position where I can do something, I'm going to change it. But then they don't, and yeah. then there, you you see those staff NCOs, you know, especially for me, um, training them. You know, so the academies would all come through the the cash trainer, and like, okay, you know that these things are issues. What are you changing that for? Yeah. When I um, I got to before we deployed, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of hurry up and fucking wait, mm-hmm. and I couldn't stand it. Mm-hmm. And it was a constant, hey, uh, you bat your gun. You're like, what, what are we doing? Why are Why are we just sitting around waiting right now? Well, we're waiting on this, this, this. Um, and it was, I mean, several units. Hey, you know, lieutenant, captain, 
what the fuck are we doing right now? Why are we just sitting here? We could do something to employ them better. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no reason. There's absolutely no fucking yeah. reason that, you know, Marines should be after dinner chow, yeah. sitting there waiting to get released. Yeah. Go the fuck home. Yeah. You know, and so and one of the things that I like, I said, I, I started off as infantry. Yeah. And um, I ended up getting out really because I wanted to re-enlist to come back on the East Coast. I was out at Camp Pendleton, LAR. And uh, they were like, look, you know, you haven't been here on station long enough. You didn't go on float to Okinawa. Uh, we're short on NCOs. I was a corporal at the time. We're short on NCOs, so we want you to re-enlist and stay here. I said, well, I really want to re-enlist to go to Camp Lejeune. I want to get back on the East Coast for my family. Well, we can't do that. Well, why? Well, because we'll be short on an NCO. I said, well, if I get out, aren't you still short on an NCO? Why wouldn't you let me, you know, go yeah. over there? But uh, so I got out and went to the reserves. Um, and then, you know, came back on, on active duty. But I re-enlist, I, I did a, a lat move to artillery for an observer. Mm-hmm. And that community is so small, so tight, you know, that we could do, you know, whatever we wanted. Um, and there was a lot of times where I was like, look, we're, this is our this is our daily plan. This is what we're going to get done. And when we're done, you guys are fucking gone. Yeah. And I got a lot of, you know, feedback, you know, from other staff and CEOs. Like, what, why are you, we didn't release headquarters platoon yet. Hey, look, you guys have your fucking training plan. Yeah. These are my guys. Yeah. We fucking busted our ass. We've yeah. been busting our ass we all day. We got done what we were supposed to do, and they're done. Yeah. Can we do that? Well, fuck yeah. You're a goddamn yeah. staff it, NCO. Yeah. What, do you, what do you mean no, can you and do that's, that? And that's the thing. It's like it doesn't make sense. Like there was literally like uh, I have a friend of mine who's a, a drilling reservist in Jersey. <laughs> And uh, I had I had her up, and I was like, "Hey, what do you what are you guys doing for drills?" Because I I had some shirts that I had, people reached out to me that they wanted to buy shirts for the podcast. So I was like, "Hey, I'll come by the unit. I'll buy you know I'll send I'll pay you know give the guys the shirts whatever." She was like, "Oh, well, we're gonna be at Earl." I was like, "Why?" She was like, "Because the CEO had it in his head that we haven't gone out to a field op, so we're gonna go sleep in the in on Earl." <laughs> I said, for what reason? <laughs> she goes, for no reason besides yeah. we're going to be in the field. So literally, they just, just to do it, they just put 300 Marines in the field for no reason. There was no training going on. Right. There was no convoys going on. It was just so they could be in the field. It's like, bro, what? Yeah. Like, what? See, and that's an opportunity missed because what they could have done, you take them to the field. And that's where you fucking have some fun. Yeah, you do a mess night. You, you do, absolutely. You do something. You, you do know? something to build camaraderie. Absolutely. And that's like the thing that I said, like when I was on recruiting duty, I said that to my CEO. I was like, sir, because he had us read this book called Legacy. Uh, it's about the uh, the rugby team, uh, the All Blacks. And he asked, hey, why, what did the book mean to you? What did you receive from the book? And my, I was the first person to raise my hand. And I said, we've lost our legacy. And everybody in the room, staff and CEOs and above, what do you mean? I was like, bitch, the whole book is about legacy. We don't have one. Yeah. We don't do anything. We do nothing that has to do with the Marine Corps. And you wonder why recruiters feel like they are not Marines anymore. Right. Because when was the last thing time they did anything Marine Corps related? Yep. The moment they get on the duty, they put this uniform on and they wear it every single day and they feel outside of themselves because they're doing something that's foreign to themselves. It's not their job. They can't go to Marine, like, and now, especially in the world that we're living in right now, the Marine Corps hasn't had a ball. Right. So now these Marines, they wait all year long to go to one event to just not think about recruiting duty, and you took that away from them. Yeah. So now you have these Marines who can't even go to a Marine Corps ball, and then you expect them to work 24-7, 365 days a year for three years, and you're mad when they don't want to produce. Right. When was the last time you did anything for them? Like, why not give them a, a 72? Why not give them time to go out? Why not, you know, a reward the number? You know what? The, the office that has the best numbers, we're going to get, we're going to send you guys, you know, to we're going to give you guys a dinner. I don't fucking know. Something. We're going to pay you guys to go out to Manhattan to go to this restaurant to do whatever. Or just do a mess night. Or do, like, anything. And then when they do do shit, it's a thing for only the staff and seals and above. What about all the rest of the recruiters? Yeah. What about the rest of the command? What about the guys who are out there working every single day? Like for just recently, I had this. Um, this is happening right now. So who? Do, I don't give a fuck. It, you know, someone might hear this and say some shit, but whatever. So the Marine Corps canceled the Marine Corps bowl again, right? So my unit said, "Hey, we're not gonna have a bowl." 
The same day they said we're not going to have a ball, they said, but we're going to have a mess night for Stats and Seals and above. <laughs> what the fuck? And I'm like, wait a minute. So we can't have a Marine Corps ball, but we can have a mess night in a bar, nut to butt, seated right next to each other, drinking yeah. out of the same grog, drinking the same drinks in a bar right next to each other with no masks on. That's okay, but we can't have a ball. Right. And then it's only for staff and above. So now forget, and then now how does that make the private to sergeant feel? Absolutely. We can't celebrate our birthday, but you can? What, we don't rate? What, we haven't been in the Marine Corps long enough? Oh, COVID, COVID doesn't attack staff and above. COVID only attacks privates to sergeants. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. And that, was the, and that was the thing that happened, and it was just like, what the fuck are we doing? And the funnier part was, is you had this guy who's all like, you spent this whole entire day at drill wearing a mask. You have to have your mask on. You have to have your mask on. But now we just spent five hours in a bar with none of us wearing a mask, and it wasn't a problem. Yeah. Where's the common sense? And it's just like, and, and the reason why I'm talking about that is just because we, we preach about how to prevent alcoholism from happening or how to prevent suicide from happening or how to do all of these things. And it's just the fucking basics. Just be a better person, be a human being, be relatable, be someone that you can talk to and just reach out to people and that's it. Yeah. But everybody gets so fucking... It, it becomes more about the the number, like, oh, 22, 22, instead of it actually being about the change. Instead of enacting change, it's like, hey, watch me do this Facebook post about me doing push-ups because I'm, I'm better by trying to help people. Or no, just call 22 people today. You know, it's just, I don't know. So is there plans of you to write another book? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my originally my plan was um, three three books. Okay. Uh, I wanted to do the next book. I mean, I already kind of have planned. I already actually got a couple stories in. Um, I'd love to get one from you. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I put one in, um, and then a third book, uh, and then so I've actually wrote it. You know, these are Marines putting stories in, and I put it in a way though that I wanted anybody civilians can read it, other services can read it, um, and I actually got approached. Uh, by a couple people who were in the army that were, hey, look, I fucking love this book. I think I, you know, I would love, you know, to read an army version. Mm. Like, okay, well, listen, I can help put it together, but I don't really know. I'm like, I'm not army, so I yeah. can't add my own stories. I would have to, you know, do, you know, get stories from other people. And he was like, okay, well, I could probably help you with that. Yeah, like, yeah. All right, well, you know, my wife absolutely hates this idea. Like, I don't want to see you writing a book a year for the next ten years. Like, okay, well, if I retire and I'm having fun with it, look, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. You know, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, immediate plans is, had to take a couple months off because I was so, like, overwhelmed with everything going on over the yeah. last couple months. Uh, but um, here after the new year, I'm going to start putting together everything for the second book. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan is, you so know. So what kind of feedback have you gotten from people about the so, positive and negative? Oh, I, I haven't gotten anything negative okay. yet, which I'm kind of, you know, I'm, uh, like, there's, somebody's got something negative yeah. to say, and I wish, you know, if they do, reach out and say, hey, look, you know, I think you could have done this better, yeah, yeah. because I want to improve. Yeah. My biggest worry when I uh, when I was doing the dedication page is those names were, the first couple are people that I know personally, and then after that was um, a... Um, 22 until none, I believe the page was uh, a Facebook page. Um, her son is on there in the like the top couple, and she helps moderate this page. And she reached out to all these families, mm -hmm. and they all submitted their names. And I said, "Listen, this this isn't you know your glory book. This isn't you know tales of um, you know gallantry. This is drinking strippers stupidity like." I want to make sure that you understand this yeah. before you get this book yeah. and you're like, why is my son on the front oh page of this God. book? Oh my God, yeah. So, yeah, 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 it's, it's perfect. All right. And um, I knew, you know, when they started getting these books, I was just waiting, like, okay, just, God, hopefully none of them say, you know, like, take my son out of here. Yeah. And um, the response has been pretty overwhelmingly like, this is awesome. I'm glad, you know, my son had his name in this book. He would have loved, you know, to be part of this. He would, you know, this is exactly what they would have wanted. Mm -hmm. 
And you know that not only too, but I mean they want to have their you know their it keeps their their kid's name yeah. alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but uh, even like the civilians, I when um, I first started this, one of my good friends, female cat, uh, no military experience, nothing to do. You know, she said, "Hey, look, I'd love to help you edit this book." And I was like, "All right, well, let me send you one first. Let, let's just see, you know, what you think." She called me up and she was like crying, laughing. And she was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever fucking seen. I want in on this. And I said, okay. I said, well, listen, you know, these are stories from Marines. Who, and I wanted to keep it Marines. Yeah. And, you know, she kind of talked me into like, look, let's change some of this a little bit that it's not just Marines that can read it. Anybody can read it. Civilians will read it. Parents of these kids are going to want to read it. Let's kind of not you know, dumb it up, but let's not, you know, take out some of the military jargon yeah. that it still remains. Yeah. Um, and we did. Yeah. And I liked it even better. Yeah. You know, and it, and it came out really well. And I'm glad I said, I'm, I'm fucking happy with it. Yeah. Uh, when I first started the project, I talked to a couple different Marines uh, who own their own publishing companies and then a, a couple civilians. And they told me, look, you know, as a first time author and an unnamed, you know, unknown, like nobody knows who fucking Gunny Esterly is. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not a, a Kyle Carpenter. You yeah, know, like yeah. I, I'm not, you know, don't expect to sell 100 books your first year or if ever. And while I was doing research on how to actually write the book, I, I joined a lot of Facebook writing groups. And you see all these people who, look, uh, my book has been on Amazon for six months. I've only sold two books. Okay, well, I, I believe enough that, uh, okay, look, if I do this right, I'll be able to sell 100 books. That was kind of my goal. I wanted to I wanted to raise seventeen seventy five for Save Twenty Two, the uh, organization that I you know said, and I was like you know if I, if it takes me a year to get there, awesome, you know I that's what I wanted to do, and um, put everything out. So right now um, it made it up to number five on the new releases uh, under the military veterans category. Um, in a month. Uh, it's it's actually been out exactly a month now. Uh, we sold 150 books. Oh wow! Um, and it's already at you know raised a thousand dollars. That's awesome. So I'm like you know well, shit. You know I would love to have my goal now be instead of trying to raise 1775 in a year, I want to do it by the end of the year. I want to be able to you know sometime by Christmas, be able to donate a check to 1775. Uh, you know for you know bringing awareness to veteran suicide. Um, but so I'm. Happy with it. Everybody that's read it, you know, absolutely relates to the stories. They found them funny, and that was kind of the goal, yeah. you know. And and it's again, it's it's getting people to talk to each other, yeah. you know. And that that was my whole goal. If I can, if I can just get people to laugh a little bit, and they call a, a buddy, yeah, like, hey, do you remember this time back yeah. in here, you know? And, and and it gets them on the phone with Bro, another friend. I'm telling you right now from the experience that I had last. Like I said, I got it. I got it yesterday in the mail. Um, I had a I got beer. I read like I think like twenty or thirty pages, and and I liked it because I could read it like because I the way that I am when I read is that I have to read an entire chapter before I can stop. Yeah. So now with this being all a bunch of short stories, I'm yeah. like, oh, I I can. You stop can read right two now. pages, but and come then back at the more. same time, I'm like, wait a minute, I want to hear the next one. Yeah. I want to hear the yeah. next one. So it's definitely an awesome book, um, and I appreciate what you're doing with it. I also like the message behind it. Um, what was the, where did you get the name of it from? Was it just, like, where did that come from? So that was, I mean, the Marines born in a bar, right? Tom Tower. Yeah. You know, and, and being from this area, um, you know, we go over there every year for the birthday. Um, and like I said, this came out about 10 years or so. And this is, we're at a strip club and we're talking about this. And like, dude, like, this, this is it. Like, it's got to be born in the bar. Mm -hmm. um, the... Untold stories of Uncle Sam's misguided children came in afterwards, mm -hmm. um, but um, it's always been, you know, that because I wanted that that story life. Those are the stories that everybody, when we go out to a bar, that's what we're doing. We're telling stories, we're yeah. you know, relating, we're you know, doing all that stuff, and it just made sense, bro. Like, like what you did in this book is exactly what I wanted to do on my podcast. Yeah, um, because it's exactly the same thing that I want. Is that you know. And that's the problem that I have, and I like the way that you were able to do it because you were able to put it in a book without pe 
putting people's names. Yep. Or having, you know, some people say, hey, you can keep my name. Other people, you change the names of the stories because, like, and that's the problem with the podcast is a lot of people <laughs> yeah. who are still on active duty are like, hey, bro, I really can't come on a podcast and talk about this because sure. I would be kicked out of the Marine Corps tomorrow. Yeah. Or and even myself. Like, I have a lot of stories that I could tell about Marine Corps recruiting for the past four years, but I can't really tell them because I'm still on in the Marine Corps. Right. So it's like, so with the podcast, it's a lot harder. And especially yeah. because even, even if, like, I have a gunnery sergeant come on here and I don't put his face on and I don't put his name on, People know his voice. Absolutely. So people are like, oh, that's Gunny so and so. Yeah. Like the one of my buddies. He was like, Yeah, hey, I'm just gonna go as Gunny O. And I'm like, bro, everybody knows you. Like everyone <laughs> yes, knows your yeah. voice. They're gonna know who yeah. Gunny O is, bro. So that's why it's like it's harder for me um to do the same thing. But like that's what I wanna do. Like I wanna you know, I wanna eventually have a segment dedicated to anybody who was lost. Um, so whether they were lost in combat, whether they were lost in a training accident, whether they were lost due to suicide, because I feel like their stories, like their family, will never know their child as a sergeant in the right. Marine Corps. They'll know they served, but they'll never know. You know, so like the recent, you know, um, people at the KIAs that we had in Kabul. Yep. You know, there were some of those men who had children, you know, where there was one guy, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but he, his daughter was born like a couple of days later. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And, you know, that daughter is never going to know her father's story. Yeah. So if I can get his friends on the podcast to talk about him as a Marine, to talk about him as a person, then she'll be able to live through those stories. Right. I mean, yeah, she never knew her dad, but she can hear about how great of a Marine he was, how great of a leader he was. You know, So like I have the episodes of Pat's Purpose where I talk about Patrick Duva and his sister and his fiance come on and they talk about how they dealt with losing him from cancer. And then I have his squad leader come on and talk about how he dealt with it mm -hmm. and how, you know, why did they start their nonprofit and what is the nonprofit for? And that's all because, you know, and like you were saying before, you know, like, who the fuck is Gunny, Gunny Esri? I'm not Kyle Carpenter. I'm not this person. Right. Well, the reality of it is you're Gunny Esri. And it doesn't take away from your story because you still have a story to tell. And the reality of it is, is that, like, and this is nothing negative towards those Purple Heart recipients, but there's people who have died that did some fucking sick shit that no one's ever heard about. And those are the people that I want to be able to talk about, you know? Like my buddy Scott, he did an episode with me. Um, he's a double amputee, now blind. And um, he talks about his time in Afghanistan, about how he lost his best friend. Um, you know, he drinks PBR just because that was his friend's favorite beer, even yeah. though he hates the taste of PBR. Yeah. He just says, you know what, get me a tall boy with PBR for my boy. Yeah. You know, uh, I believe his name was Miller. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just, you know, that's what I want to do with this. Um, I'm glad I picked up your book. I'm glad we were able to get this together. Um, I guess the only thing that I would leave this off is um, your 17-year career in the Marine Corps. What advice would you give to anybody who's in that leadership position right now, that 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 gunnery sergeant who's you know in the position to be able to reflect, to be able to you know give change and be able to make things happen, what 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 advice would you give for them? Uh, you know, I think you said we get to know your Marines, like honestly, truly get to know them. You know, you'll be able to get further on figuring out what their strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, knowing how they react and understanding how they make decisions. Um, and I think one of the biggest things for me that took me a while to really figure out too was I'm replaceable. If I die, this person has to take over. He better know what my fucking job is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sometimes that's hard to let go of control of everything. I want to do everything. And then you realize that your junior Marines are lacking all the knowledge that they need to um, you know getting to know them and helping them learn and become better staff NCOs and NCOs um, and really I mean just you know providing that leadership mm -hmm. you know don't talk down to people just be respectful you respect somebody they're gonna respect you back yeah um, and it all comes down to you know just learning about them taking yeah. like a an actual like 
I want to know you because mm -hmm. I want to know you. Well, and I was going to end this, but you just said something that I kind of got to go off. So, like, you just said not talking down to somebody. I think the number one thing I hate about the Marine Corps is the people who do that. Yep. Like, bro, I don't know. I remember I just checked into the new unit, and I wish I knew who it was because I would have said something. But this Marine says to a, 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 a Marine who is out of standards, clearly the Marine's out of standards. He knows this. You know this. We all know this. We don't need to make light of the fact that the Marine's out right. of standards. It's clear as day, right? And again, we don't know what's going on in this kid's life. We have no idea why it happened or how it happened, especially in the reserve program because you don't see the kid every day. Sure. So you don't know what's going on in his background. And this Marine, he ended up walking through the ranks. So instead of falling out the correct way, he just cut through the ranks, right? And was he wrong 100%? You don't do that. Whatever. Whatever. The, mar the gunnery sergeant goes, okay, thing. And I'm like, what the fuck was that for? Right? Yeah, what that's... the fuck was the purpose in that? What did that just do? Yeah. Clearly, this Marine already knows he's out of regulations. Whether he was or not, whether the kid was a PT stud, why would you call an actual person a thing? That's the fucking problem. Right. Because the reality of it is is that when every, and that's why I can't stand it, when people put this uniform on, it's like their, their mentality changes. Because especially as a reservist, if you were at your civilian job and someone walked by and you said, okay, thing... You'd be in fucking you'd you'd have a lot of problems. Yeah, no shit. Human resources would be up your fucking yep, ass, absolutely. and there'd be a lot of fucking problems on the table. But because you are a gunnery sergeant or a sergeant or anything, and you feel that now that I have this collar and I have this rank on my collar, I can just go ahead and call people thing because right. it just makes sense. Yeah. And it's like, bro, do you want me to call you that? What I you have children? Would you like me to call your child a thing? Right. You'd feel some type of way, right? Yeah. Like that's somebody's fuck, and you wonder why people commit suicide. Well, because you just called the motherfucker. You just, well, right now I'm calling him a motherfucker. <laughs> you know, you just called the person yeah. a thing, you know, or as I just called you a motherfucker. But, you know, it's just like, it's so annoying because people let that get to them, you know? And it's just like, bro, just be a better person. Talk to people how you would want to be talked to. Right. And just realize that we, you know, like I had a friend of mine, the, the, he was a, he was an overweight Marine and, and he knew it. You know, he was dealing with shit at home. He was, you know, working, you know, seven days a week. He didn't have work time for PT. He was, you know, he was a father. He was like, and, and I like, I don't, I'm not making excuses for the dude. I'm saying like this dude worked like 80, 90 hours a week and then went to drill. Like it was, yeah. the, the dude didn't have the time and he wasn't a bad eater. He was just naturally a big dude. Right. Like he was naturally always had the tape from the moment he joined the Marine Corps. He was just a big guy, got older and um, got heavy. And I remember the sergeant major walked by the. We were in medical, sitting down, and he just looks at him and he goes, "Wow, somebody needs to find the salad." And it's like, bro, what the fuck was the purpose of that? Yeah. Like, if we weren't in uniform, and you were just a normal dude in civilian clothes who walked by me and said that, would there be an issue if I punched you in the fucking face? Right. But no, because you're a sergeant major and you're wearing a uniform, it's okay that you talk to me like that. Yeah. Like. No, right. you like, know, I, I mean, respect goes such a long way. Yeah, you know, and, and that's and, the thing is, like, you want him to respect you and say good morning, Sergeant Major. Right. But now, what did you just say to him? Yeah. If that Marine sees you later on today, I hope he doesn't say shit to you right. because he shouldn't have. He doesn't have to respect you. Yeah. And you know, I mean, as as Marines, I mean, we're we're training the whole time for war, right? yeah. war time. So now you're in that combat situation, right? And I need to know, you know, and believe you're going to help me. You you got my back. Mm -hmm. I've got your back. Yeah. We fucking absolutely believe that. But when you when you introduce that fucking disrespectful attitude, mm -hmm. like is that fucking Lance Corporal? Is he is he gonna like risk his life? He, he especially reservists, mm -hmm. right? You got family at home. You got a real job at home. You got kids at home. Are you gonna run through bullets, jump yeah. on a grenade to save someone who just fucking yeah doesn't give a shit you, about you? Just, no, yeah. fuck no, man. Yeah. It, they're just they're not gonna do yeah. it. Uh, but just you know. Getting to know that that Marine and showing them the respect—that's mm -hmm. what—that's what's going to drive those yeah. kids to do better yeah. and to be that you know that backbone that they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I before I end this episode, for anybody who's listening, I apologize for my neighbor. He decided <laughs> that in the beginning of this episode, he was going to use his freaking 
blower to <laughs> clean off his car and dry off his car, and now apparently he's moving leaves. So if you have heard a little hum in the background, I apologize. I'm going to try to see if I can edit that out. If I can't, again, I do apologize. Um, but um, for those of you who are listening, please go get Born in a Bar by Gunnery Sergeant Esterly. I'm going to leave a... Um, I'll leave his Instagram on there in the description. I'll leave a. I'll get a link from you for the book. Please go and buy the book. Um, again, read the book. You know, share it with another person. Um, and just you know, we're, all he's trying to do, all we're trying to do, is just help stop veteran suicide or really just get people to come together, build camaraderie um, like this. Right now, we literally never met until today, um, and here we are doing a podcast about helping people. Um, so thank you so much, Gunny, for coming out. I really for appreciate it. Um, and to everybody listening, this is going to be on Spotify, YouTube. Follow the YouTube, follow the Spotify, follow me on Instagram, um, at Semper Sometimes. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate you guys. And again, thank you, Gunny. Thank you.